In the constantly changing world of fundability, the big question is this. How are entrepreneurs and real estate investors like us, ones who want to grow our businesses and who are tired of paying for really expensive alternative lending, how do we tap into the most inexpensive money available and do it without the hassle of typical borrowing? That is the question, and this podcast will give you the answers. Welcome to the Get Fundable Podcast with your host, Merrill Chandler. Near Seattle, we're down in the bottom part of the state. I could hold you personally responsible for the pandemic that is currently infecting our. You wouldn't be the first, but um, nation, right? The uh, yeah, but basically, I have a great luxury because we live on a farm, and so it's not like I'm stuck in an apartment somewhere right. in downtown. We've got 25 acres to go wander around and mess with the animals and and uh, listen to little birds and go down to the stream and go get to the, the avian flu from some birds that are on your properties that's yeah. fair enough yeah but anyway so it's it's great uh, certainly it's uh it's quieter time but it's given us a lot of opportunity as a company or as a group of companies really to think about you know what does all this mean and what opportunities can be found which i'm sure we'll spend time Talking. Yeah, I, I, I want to get to that for um, part of the reason why I was excited to have you on, because in my in my podcast, I'm really I'm really picky about who I bring in to uh, to to share, because everything I do is about fundability, making sure that your business, your personal life, you have the tools necessary to leverage right your greatest asset, which is your reputation. Well, you are that the business equivalent of my what I do for funding you do for how do you maintain your business reputation? How do you keep it bulletproof? So I can't wait to get to, to for everybody. We have like eight different uh, uh, channels that are going to be enjoying this conversation. So first of all, tell us, tell me a little bit about um, you and how you got it work because it's uh, Laughlin and Associates, as well as your, your commitment to your magnify your wealth, right? Your, your, it isn't just protecting, but then expanding and growing. So kind of, kind of share, uh, share with us, your 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 journey and how you ended up here now that we're all in sequester mode um the journey i'll try to make the journey super fast because it's 36 years of journey but um the bottom line is, is this i am um, i came home from chris for christmas from my one and only year of college uh, <laughs> i came home from christmas or for christmas and i didn't have any money and so I did something that we had done as Boy Scouts, which was go out and collect old newspapers. So I borrowed a pickup truck from somebody at church, drove around, picked a bunch of old newspapers and made like, this is 19, uh, this would be Christmas 1982. And uh, uh, as an 18 year old with a borrowed truck in 1982, in a matter of a few days, I made about $3,000. And I thought, that's more money than my dad makes, right? <laughs> and right. certainly that's a month, not, not in a few days. So I went back to school and along with a friend, we organized um, a, a flyer and a route book and we mapped out the city of Portland, Oregon. And when we went back home after school at the end of April, we just started blanketing the city with these flyers and we started picking up these old newspapers. And before you know it, we had about 5,000 monthly clients and we, and then we started adding other things. We had another truck and some more guys. So before I was 19, I had three people on payroll and two trucks. And then I went away on a Mormon mission. I grew up in the Mormon church, went away on a Mormon mission and um, the business operated the whole time I was gone a couple of years. <laughs> That's and awesome. A I, passive income as a, as a, as a kid year old yes. and, and money was going into the bank for me. And I got home and I resumed my involvement for a little while. And then I met this super cute girl that I've now been married to for 33 years. She is super cute. So. And um, I thought, well, she doesn't want to be married to a garbage man. So <laughs> I sold the business uh, to the other guy that I was involved with, sold my part and went out and bought my first inventory of cellular telephones. 
and built became one of the first cellular phone guys in the Northwest back in 1986. Always cutting edge because I have heard the story before, so I'm already leaning in to where you're. But yeah, and, cutting edge. So I'm, and I'll go, I'll go fast. And then that whole industry changed after I'd been in it for about five or six years. In one meeting, and this is something important for everybody to listen to. In one meeting with these higher ups at the carrier GTE MobileNet, which would now be like Sprint or Verizon or whatever. Um, in one meeting, they changed the entire nature of our business. They took away our, our commission structure and our um, co-op advertising structure and how fast we got paid on things and how, how they would help, uh, um, uh, uh, what am I trying to say? Help them fund or, or how they would carry paper on, on uh, the phones. Right. And it, basically like flooring for an appliance or a car lot. All this stuff, effective at the meeting, not 30 days. <laughs> no right time. now, no, no, you're no. done. Listen, everybody, this, this is going to be vital for our, uh, for our conversation today. So as a young entrepreneur thinking, well, I'm pretty big compared to some of these guys, and I'm in the newspaper, and I'm on the radio, and I'm pretty cool. We've got multiple stores, and I'm kicking butt, right? And I've bought two different houses. We've moved up twice. We were driving new cars. I thought, oh, I'm pretty cool. This was one of the great business lessons of my life. Thankfully, it happened when I was young. Um, all the guys with a little bit of gray hair, they all closed up shop, but not me. I stayed in. <laughs> and before you know it, I'd used up all the cash and the business credit line and my personal credit cards and my HELOC on my home. And now I'm hundreds of thousands of dollars upside down with no way out. I'm and screwed. A changed, and a completely different organizational structure. You can't do business the same way you could. So sitting with my nine month pregnant wife with our second child, she is sitting next to me in bankruptcy court as we declare <laughs> bankruptcy. And um, so we had about 18 months of trying to figure something new out which is what a lot of entrepreneurs go through. You know, they don't want to get a job. They want to go figure something out. We um, recreate ourselves. Everybody who's listening, how many times have you recreated yourself? It's like part of our DNA, right? DNA, yeah. So I started a couple of things that actually worked, but didn't work well enough. Mm -hmm. And then one day, this guy that I knew, he was a member of our church, but he was in a different congregation. He calls up, he says, hey, Aaron, can I take you out to lunch? Well, all I knew about him was that he was, I thought, rich, right? Because he had more than me, a lot more than me. <laughs> That's he had a brand new suburban, it, right? which in the Mormon church, if you have a brand new suburban, that was pretty cool because <laughs> we all have all these kids. And then um, I knew he's, I don't know. So we go to lunch and he said, hey, you know, I'm sorry to hear about your business having trouble, but um, would you be interested in? And having a job. And I was like, I don't now Here I am. I, I had crappy grades in high school. I went to one year of junior college. I've been working in two businesses that I'd started and by my own wits had made yeah, work. The, and then one the of bootstrap them bootstrap entrepreneur, right? <laughs> one had completely failed at the end. Uh, and I would say no fault of my own, but it kind of was my fault because I didn't get out. Right. Um, or you didn't see, you don't know the cycle. You weren't reminded yet of the cycle. I of didn't the, know of how it worked yet. It was my first yep. uh, time facing a hard time. So he offers me, I said, what's the job? I said, what's the company? He said, well, we're publicly traded. We're NASDAQ. We have about 350 offices around the world. And, uh, you know, we're growing. I said, okay, cool. What, what job are you offering me? Because I felt utterly um, unworthy of a job, <laughs> right? And he said, I'd like to hire you to be our vice president of sales. I'm like, cha-ching. No, but it was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> Big, a vice president of a public company? I was 29 years old when I started that job. Um, I did it for three and a half years, made a lot of money in the stock, left there on good terms. They even kept me on. I, I quit one day on a whim. I stayed on for another year on a contract with them, but went out and started what we're doing now, which was because I'd made a lot of money in the stock. We started buying companies, uh, five or six or seven companies in the opportunity to buy Laughlin Associates was presented to me. Awesome. 
Um, we bought it. We've, I've continued to do that, but, I, but Laughlin was one I wanted to keep. And my business partner, Lee Morgan, and I have now had it since 2001. Got it. We went through the, we came in right at the end of the dot-com burst. Right. We rode the, the uh, real estate up and All then the crash yep. and then up again, right? We've just gone through that. And now we have COVID. We had, you know, we had a, a big battle with the IRS early in that game, uh, starting in 03 and ending in 07, uh, which was another hardship. Um I don't know if you want me to go into that story here or not. Well, I, I would love to say what we what we learned in the process of cycles, because th that's what I want to address today. And you have yeah. so much experience on how to protect from the cycle, right? So I think it's reasonable then to add this one thing without going into it and without freaking everybody out. Um, in, in 2002, the IRS and the FBI came to our office, actually raided our office, along with a bunch of other places around the country, seeking information about somebody we had done a lot of business with. Right. And that's what everybody, that's what they were hitting all these places simultaneously. They arrested him at the Red, same time. Yellow tape, the whole place. All that. Um, they, we were not named in that lawsuit. Right. But they asked me, they said, but, and we had stopped working with him a couple years before. And so they were saying, boy, this guy's been so tricky to figure out. Would you mind answering some questions? And I said, sure. Cause I thought that was the right thing to do. <laughs> I thought I, I a whole different I, podcast episode, right? But yeah. That's a different one. Avoiding uh, severe life trauma. But the bottom line <laughs> is I answered their questions. And four months later, uh, my partner and I were indicted on conspiracy, conspiracy. and they said, you either knew or should have known. And they, and they later admitted that they knew we didn't know, but because we had materially assisted by f filing some companies for him, um, we were sucked in. Right. You're, so, you're complicit. Yeah. So after $2 million in legal fees, we finally gave up and we took a plea bargain and went to prison for 18 months. Uh, we actually you served 14 months and part of it's good, good time and part of it's uh, yeah. probation. But the point is, so I've been through that early company failure, through the dot-com failure, through Black Monday, which was in the 80s. I've been through yeah. the rise and fall of the real estate market, fighting the government, going to prison. FYI, if you build a company that actually is a real company, it will operate even when you're not there. And the yes. year that I was in prison, I still took home nine hundred and seventy four thousand dollars so <laughs> which probably pissed off the feds anyway but they got a lot of money too yeah. but the point is we've gone through all these cycles and now we're entering well we're not entering we're in the what i believe is the early stage of this cycle not that we're going to be quarantined forever or not you know but or, or kind of you know social but the distancing. effects of the quarantine are going to have a powerful impact but i'll tell you the world as we knew it a month ago will not go back to just what we had before any more than it did before 9-11. Absolutely. Absolutely. Any more than it did before the internet arrived in the mid nineties. The world will be fundamentally changed. And I, I'm looking forward to your questions and uh, hope Absolutely. to be able to provide some perspective. No, first of all, thank you. Um, be, you're you're one of my heroes because we've shared that same that that same experience of being, uh, of being at cause, building an empire, right, two or three times, and being at effect, right, being at somebody else's. Uh, like you said, there's always a bigger fit. I I'm using the term paraphrasing you. There's always a bigger fish, and we and we ultimately have to play the game well enough so that we can protect ourselves. So the 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 purpose of our our time together here is i want to i want to discuss your read uh, on the pace and how we've never had it, we've never had an a health uh epidemic pandemic turn us into a a, a uh, into a recession right it's always been a financial some sort of collapse mortgages got the rugs pulled out of them whatever it was so uh, Give me your your thoughts before we go into uh, helping our, our our listeners and viewers 
understand what's next and how to how to prevent. Um, what do you see over the next month, three months, six months? What what do you notice from your experience? Because we we were like I said, we've shared this roller coaster ride uh, a couple of times. What do you see coming? Um. So I had been predicting, and, and I'm not saying I was unique in this prediction, but this was my anticipation and what we were gearing up for. Right. I, I had been um, foreseeing, and I assumed it would be sometime after the next election. I thought, okay, um, interest rates are going to go up. Tariffs are going to increase against China because Trump would feel emboldened by, I really believe he'll be reelected. Whether or not you like him, I mean... <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, he's the only one campaigning right well, now. Well, the devil you know is better than the devil you don't know. Yeah, and and I think, um, <laughs> say whatever you want. I mean, it would be in, in a very difficult position to be in as a leader because you're never going to please everybody. And it's and it's government, right? It's, it's an imperfect uh, organization. But anyway, I had been anticipating interest rates going up and um, further tariffs on trading partners, which would increase cost of goods um, as we were having to try to, as companies were trying to ramp up here. Right. And all of a sudden your t-shirts that were made in Bangladesh, now we're going to cost twice or three times as much because they're made in Iowa. Right. And um, <laughs> I, I, I thought between rates going comparing, up and yeah. cost of goods uh, of consumables going up, it's going to slow the economy down on purpose. So we don't have a runaway um, uh, inflation. Rates, et cetera. Yeah. And uh, I thought there will be a reset in the market. And I thought at that time, it won't be like 08. It will be much more focused, in my opinion, it would be focused on um, high paying warehouse jobs, high paying um, places where humans are doing a lot of physical work with equipment. Um, and I thought when, when those companies have to shrink down a minute, they're going to go in and, and take that opportunity um, probably through private equity money or through selling shares to increase their use of robots and artificial intelligence. I also thought uh, companies like bookkeeping companies, um, a lot of people in the accounting industry, things that can be automated would be automated, similar to what you've seen in automotive factories and so on. Right. And, and so I thought, well, that's coming down the road and that will be an opportunity because remember i'm also in private equity i'm still buying companies and taking right. companies public so um i thought well that's gonna happen and we're gonna have a great opportunity if you're in a position to be a buyer right and if you're forced to be a seller we would be able to provide an exit for people without them just closing up shop well i think what's happened with the pandemic is it has um, excelled, well, it is brought right now to our doorstep, the beginning of that. And you see um, at the time of this recording, yesterday, a bunch of Amazon workers walked out. Today, Whole Foods did a sick out or whatever they called it, you a know, uh, but they, and of course, Whole Foods is owned by Amazon, but um, they're, they're the people I'm talking about at Amazon, highly paid relatively highly paid warehouse people and they already have a lot of robots right right and a lot of ai and so these companies you can bet jeff bezos and the rest of the 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 kingpins out there are only going to tolerate this so far right right before they just spend the make the capital investments to get rid of those people and have one person who can fix a machine that does the work of, of 10 people or 20 people. Right. So I think what's happened is that's accelerated. So what's the result of that? I think a lot of the jobs that will be lost, I know there's a lot of restaurant workers and that sort of thing out of business, right? Or out of work right now. And right. that's um, unfortunate, but some of those are lifetime careers. Some are transient, you know, people move in and out of it as they need it. But I think you're going to see a lot of these people who've been working somewhere for five, 10, 15, 20 years that have put, got money in a 401k, they're gonna lose their jobs. 
they're going to then learn about self-directing their 401k. And we're going to see an explosion of micro businesses. The, it, the, yeah, it, the, um, the, an explosion of the, the micro Solo investor. Yeah. yeah. The micro investor into a number of different things, but definitely within who, who, who now want to take a shot at being in, in, in control or relative control over their own life. Somewhat. Lives. Yeah. They're, they're going to do something to, they don't need to get rich. They just need to take care of themselves. Right. Right. And some of them will invest in traditional things like real estate. If they have more money, maybe oil and gas. Oil and gas is a great investment because you can write it off. Um, you know, you don't have to take it as post with post tax money. Right. You write the freaking investment off. But, um, but a lot of people will do franchises. They'll start putting in mini blinds and countertops and, you know, they'll do closet organizers and all these right. things we hear on the radio. And there'll be all these little micro businesses. And the other thing that's happening now, of course, is everybody freaked out about, you know, could they go virtual? And we're going to see a lot of shaking out. There's a big of, um, shake out. Can, Absolutely. Does somebody have a place to sit at home? Do they have a dining room table where the dog's not showing up on a Zoom call with a client or on a phone call? Um, do they have enough broadband to function over the internet? You know, there are yeah. going to be these things that are going to shake out the the struggles that come from the shaking out will create new opportunity with technology and yeah. um the companies that just can't hold on will will go out of business and the ones that can stay on will uh have a great opportunity to buy at fire sell prices which going back to what you do is a great reason to have available lines of credit capital some discretionary spending available one of the, thank you for that. Because see, one of the things that I've always said, you and I also share this, but um, where that I'm a devotee of the idea and implemented it in my own life, a devotee of the idea that for ev that that opportunities and limitations or or disasters come in pairs, right? You cannot have one without the other. You can't have an opportunity without a devastation come or a, or a, a limitation following at some point or you cannot have exactly what's going on here without the be it being the breeding grounds for not influenza, not covid, but it breeding grounds for actual opportunity, new new pivots. And every, and what you're saying what you've been sharing is that we have an opportunity to. Uh, one of my coaches shared this as well that I that I listened to this morning, but we have an opportunity to look at the truth of the situation and now look for the opportunity, look for the pivot because it's there. The question is, is to quote the good book, do we have eyes to see and ears to hear? Right? Can can we even perceive what's happening? The the the, the organization. Everybody seems to be. Uh, trying to acclimate to being at home, being working from home, more in isolation. The, as you said, those that will can do so will th thrive. Some will survive and some will fail. So let's get to that. Um, you mentioned Laughlin was kind of one of your, the companies that you maintained that you still have. Um, uh, you also have your, uh, your magnifying your wealth, right? The expansion model of still taking care of your business, but how do you create it to, to, to thrive? Not just, so that's how, when I was coming to this, when I was making my notes on you, I was like, hold it. So I've been preaching thrive and survive for the, uh, for a minute now, but Laughlin is about to survive. And a magnifier wealth is about thriving. And I'm like, so take, take it away. What tell, tell, uh, talk to our audience about some of the things to prepare for. Uh, how do you, how do we create a business that is going to weather this storm? So how do we, how do we thrive? How do we survive? And what tools do we have that we, that we can, that, that we can give them to, to, to at least open that conversation up. Right. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to do a shameless plug that I wasn't even thinking about until, I'm, until you were just saying all that. But shameless plug see time. This little, see this little tiny book? It's got my, we've actually, we're redoing it 
you know, because create space doesn't make a six by six anymore. So it's, it's getting reformatted now, but it's, it's a little book with not very, not a lot in it, right? It's the words, the type font, the font size is big or the type the point size like, is big. It's anyway, like a book of Proverbs from Aaron Young. But this is called the critical 20, 20 critical steps to business success. And I wrote it a few years ago um, in one day because people were saying, well, what, what are like, what do I really need to know? Like, what's the fundamental part? Right. And I thought, well, okay, here's how it works. So if, the, if anybody wants this book, I think, can I, can, do you mind if I give a place? Oh, please. I, you can go, um, go to aaronscottyoung.com. Now we just are switching the CRM. So I, I don't know if the link is broken or not, but aaronscottyoung.com. And if you go to the bottom of the homepage, you can download a PDF of the book. Okay. It's free. It's no big deal. You'll have to give your email. You can always unsubscribe if I mail you something. Um, no, they're going to want more of what you've got. I'm telling you guys, th this guy's a genius. This book goes all the way from, is your idea any good? All the way through the life cycle of a business to where you replace yourself as the leader. So you, you get out of the way of somebody who's, who can now take it over right. as it's grown beyond your skill set, right? Because a real company should outgrow you. I was, I'm looking for a CEO. If you know any good, we're hey, we're 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 actually look, we're interviewing for a CEO right now, um, yeah. because of some cool things we're doing right now that I won't go into here. But um, here's the point: if you're if you're in this moment and you're wondering what do I do. The, you you mentioned something, Meryl, just a minute ago that I, I I I worry maybe went right past people. Okay. But I'm going to I'm going to restate it because I talk about it a lot. I've never done that ever before in my life. I've never talked past my my listeners. You are boom. You're brilliant. No, you said something great. So let me say this. Um. I, so a lot of people say follow your bliss, follow your passion, do. Do something you can be passionate about and you can, because when you love what you're doing, you never work a day in your life. I, and I go, okay, I mean, maybe, but that's kind of silly in my opinion. Now I enjoy what I'm doing, um, but there are other things I enjoy too. I'd rather be horseback riding than sitting right. in a board meeting, right? I'm a big horseback guy. Um, there are a lot of things I'd rather be doing that I'm more passionate about than right. my business. My belief is that, the, and this is echoing what you said a moment ago, just in, in a long sentence you said, was I believe we need to be dispassionate. We need to look at things in a Zen-like way, which means with no attachment to good, evil, right, wrong, better, best. That's worse, the point. Just be dispassionate. Look at the facts. What is happening? A lot of people right now are going, oh my gosh, woe is me. What's going on? My everything. And I'm like, but you said there's opportunity. When we have a big problem, we have big opportunities. Most people will just wring their hands. They'll just cry and go, I can't believe this stuff happens to me. And I've invested so much time and money into X when X was built for this circumstance yeah. now it's why what are we going to build because we're creative engines so right was x did x work if x worked that's great right direct yep. mail worked great before it was easy to advertise online right right um it got really easy to advertise online then it got expensive to advertise online and people started going back to direct mail I get a boatload of direct mail and direct mail is actually starting to get more readership because people are, but they're deleting all their emails. Right. right. So things change. We have to pivot with the times. If X no longer, if the way that you were, um, that you were uh, addressing the market, the way that you were engaging with the market, if that doesn't make sense in the current state of affairs, then step back and instead of going, oh my goodness, what are we going to do? Go, okay, that message doesn't work. Or even that product or that service doesn't right. work right now. So 
You, now you're a cook in the kitchen. You've got all the same ingredients sitting on the countertop that you were using three weeks ago, right? There they are. Yeah. How can you refashion those into a different, you know, casserole <laughs> into something different? No, absolutely. You know, and tacos, now let's make a burrito because a burrito will fit this marketplace, but it's the same ingredients, right? Yeah, I mean, we're out of burritos, so now we're selling taco salad, right? Yeah. I mean, that's what it is. So yep. instead of instead of people going, oh my gosh, everything I've built has turned to dust. Instead yeah. of that, say everything I've built has provided me with a bunch of assets, either physical or mental assets or social assets. You know, you've yep. got your social capital, you've got your email list, you've got your Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, Instagram, blah, 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 following. So and those are not going to go away during the pandemic people. So there's your, there's an audience still that we have all developed to one degree or another, right? Yeah. So. A brilliant friend of mine, she's got one of the top restaurants in Portland, Oregon. She was the sous chef at Le Cirque in New York when she was younger. So the number two person at Le Cirque, then she wanted to raise her daughter somewhere out of New York city. So she came to Portland, Oregon, opened a restaurant 20 years ago. It's one of the most popular restaurants in town. Um, she had moved uh, less than a year ago into a much larger space, hired more people, <laughs> done all this remodel of this old steakhouse to make it look like her place. Um, all this work, and then along comes COVID nineteen. Yeah. So they're they're doing curb, you know, hand stuff off the curb. They're doing delivery. That's cool. They're a white linen sit down restaurant. They're doing that. But you know what? The other day, she has had the number one brunch slash breakfast in the city voted on over and over and over and over again. Every to get year, into really. there for brunch on a weekend, you might stand outside in the rain for two and a half hours to get in, right? Well, so she can't serve brunch right now. So what did she do Sunday morning? She did a Facebook Live and she showed how to make her number one dish for brunch, which is their Eggs Benedict. Here's how we make it. And she was showing everybody, this is exactly how we do it. An ad hoc Mother's show. show. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So she's staying relevant where other people have disappeared. She's lifting herself up in a way that says, oh, I'm still the badass entrepreneur or a restaurateur that I was a few weeks ago. And by the way, we're still open. You can come buy food from us. And by the way, we're going to bring food to you if you want us to yeah. and all that. So she is staying relevant while her competitors are shrinking into the mud, right? Absolutely. See, that's one of the things that um, in 2008, um, Brad, my, uh, my, uh, my partner for better part of 10 years now, we, we were doing exactly what we're doing um, before in the run up, you know, 2007, 2008 and uh, making hay. And when, when the credit market, the difference about this one is there wasn't the infusion of capital at that time, right? They're, they're putting their moratoriums on payments and keeping your credit clean. All that stuff was unheard of in right. 2008. Well, but because the credit markets froze, we had all these clients who were in circumstance. We're real estate investors. We we had we're in circum certain circumstances, and so we pivoted with all, all exactly what you're saying. All the tools, all of the the mental awareness, and all the people we had already built way more than just client student relationships with. These are people who depended on us for for a uh, for. Uh, uh, coaching and counsel on how to maximize their fi the financial leverage. Right. Well, we started uh, we started working in the foreclosure defense. Right. All the foreclosure were happening, and so we literally just shifted over to foreclosure defense for our very clients who we had put into the homes. And so exactly right. it's taking it's taking it's seeing what opportunities are sitting here in front of us. So whether it's uh, reviewing some of the points of your of your book, what would you what would you say are some key, you know like what does Laughlin do that allows you to set up and protect um, even if the cow is out of the barn right now, um, how do we actually protect our businesses from 
this onslaught. Let's say we can pivot. Let's say we're willing to look at new opportunities or possibilities. What would you, what would you tell them? Well, first of all, and I'm not a doom and gloom guy. I've just been around for 36 years. <laughs> we doing all, this. The flowers always come up after winter. <laughs> yeah. I, <laughs> I believe, well, we're going to talk about um, skunk cabbage now. Um, okay. I think that there is a very high likelihood that, that, see right now, everybody's trying to be kind. They're smiling at people. They're keeping their distance. We're not hugging and shaking hands right now. Um, but everybody's being kind of kumbaya, right? right? We're kind of being very, it's like Christmas time. Everybody's trying to be gentle and kind. There will come a point when, um, somebody, there will be a lot of people that will want to blame somebody for their situation. Yeah. It, that and, human condition never changes. And so to that end, I believe if, if you've, if you're an employer, for instance, or if you've made contracts with people that then you're having a hard time fulfilling on the contract, whether you're, it's making payments, producing goods and services or whatever it is. Right. I think there's going to be an explosion of lawsuits coming out of this. I think there's going to be a lot of litigation. And of course, most litigation never gets to court. Um, the plaintiff just buries the defendant in tons of paper. They get The plaintiff gets a lawyer to work on commission to come after the deep pocket defendant, business owner. The defendant has to hire a lawyer at four, five, six hundred bucks an hour to answer the complaints, all the paper. And at some point, the defendant just says, I give up, let's settle this. I am of the, well, I know that a company that's proper, a, a properly structured corporation or LLC that's done its all of its corporate compliance work, which I would say 95% of the companies out there have not. Do not They're do completely that. out of compliance. And they don't even know it. They don't even know what they're not, what they're not doing, what they are required to do, but they don't right. know it or they don't, they have a glimmer. I, you know, years ago I said something and it's kind of stuck in a lot of my talks. I say, you, when you form that entity, when you form that LLC or that corporation, you get that corporate record book. If you have one, if you don't even have one, you're really upside down. But when you get the book and it's got all those pages and stuff in it, you get it. And you see all this stuff in it and you, you go, I know I'm supposed to do something, but I don't know what to do. So I'm just going to do nothing. Yeah. Right. And that book goes on the shelf and it just gathers dust. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to propose, I want to, I'm going to bracket for a second. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to prophesy that there's going to be a significant number of our people who are listening, that'll listen to podcasts for ages to come that are going to be like, oh, I, you don't just go to the secretary of state or division of corporations, fill out the one page online app, and then I'm good to do business. Right. I I'm solid. Right. You haven't done anything except for pay a tax. <laughs> that's all you've done. They've said, sure, we'll protect that name in our state. That's yours. And now we know you're there and we want a fee from you every year. Right. That's it. You do not have a fully fleshed out corporation or LLC. You're not in compliance. You haven't, you don't have an operating agreement. You don't have bylaws. You don't have, you haven't issued stock folks. If you've and never, you are issued, vulnerable because if, of that. If you have never issued yourself stock in a corporation, or the membership certificate for an LLC, written your name on that vellum certificate, filled out the stock ledger, issued it to you, taken the certificate away and put it somewhere else. If you haven't issued yourself stock, you do not own your company. There's a sobering thought for, I bet, 98% of the people yeah. listening. Well, I, part of the reason why you're here is because I was that guy, an entrepreneur who just says, okay, I just need a legal framework in which to sell my goods and services, hang out a shingle. And then when I, I saw your, your presentation, I mean, we've been sharing the same, you know, a, a mastermind for a minute and I see, and, and I heard those words come out of your mouth and I'm like, hold it. 
and then it goes back like you see these uh you see these movies where people actually have the paper of the stocks and they're saying yeah you own these things they are worth something just like cash dollar bills right yeah if you don't have those it you don't own the company and that was just like a, a frying pan to my head and of course now of, i i do what you now you do it everything. but it's yeah we think nothing of the fact that if we were going to go to a stock broker and invest money that we would own a certain number of shares and if we want and a lot of people do this with disney shares and with apple shares especially disney though because they're real decorative uh -huh. people will ask for one share of stock they might have a hundred shares or a thousand shares but they ask for one share physical share just so they can have it right. you, when you in the digital market when you're publicly traded they don't send back and forth the papers the paper. every time mm -hmm. it's all digital but you can request your shares and you will get a certificate that says it's worth this many shares right. and folks that is the only thing that proves that you own the company i don't care how long you've been paying the tax to your state i don't care how many people you've employed i don't care if you have a bank account it doesn't matter Nobody else is checking. It's only if you get sued or That's, you get audited or you're yeah. trying to raise outside capital or you're trying to get a government contract when they ask to see that you've actually been operating like a real business and not yes. just the shareholders alter ego. Yep. Just like it, the, an L, I found out my LLC was that I've had for years my LLC was the equivalent, was the papered equivalent of a sole proprietorship where I'm just the DBA d doing business as alter yeah. ego, just like you said. And, uh, and I knew I'm, I'm a legal eagle enough to know that that was untenable the second I was aware of it. But here's the thing. I have like seven LLCs that, that I just age myself or, you know, when I'm, when I'm ready to do something, I'm like, okay, when it becomes operational, it needs to have this thing. So how do we translate that into uh, what, what would be, so we know we need to have to be at least defensible as the owner of an organization, right? So yeah. that somebody can, can't just sue it and we surrender and, and walk away from our hard work or assets or whatever. How do we then translate that, um, that protection model and how do we and how do we use the next like you said if it starts getting a little more aggressive if it gets a little more people are need somebody to blame somebody to point the finger at what are, what are other strategies that you have you know or that you are preparing your own business for so that they can hear these new ideas uh, and and implement as well yeah so um the well, you asked a lot of stuff in there. So I'm going to try to, I'm trying to sort out exactly what you want me to say. Uh, but here's the thing, folks, if you don't have a, a, a corporation or an LLC, I strongly consider, I would strongly consider getting one. If you have anything at all to protect, there's a great guy who is a lawyer, a tax lawyer and a CPA and an enrolled agent with the IRS. His name is Sandy Botkin. And he's written a bunch of books and uh, in, I heard him, he spoke at a lot of our events in, in years past. Uh, he's retired now, but he said something that I would never say so blatantly, but he said, you would have to be brain dead to not have a corporation, right? You would have to be brain dead because he said there are thousands of deductions that a sole proprietorship cannot have cannot do. in a C corporation or in a depending on how your LLC is set up, if it's a multi-member and reporting as a C, you can do what's called a tax loss carry forward. So if you have a bad year, like we might have in 2020, um, you can carry those tax losses forward into the future up to 20 years. But it requires a certain level of, uh, a certain level of, I don't want to say sophistication, but awareness to set this up, correct? Sure. Well, if they want to, I mean, to solve that problem, if you wanted to talk to the, the Laughlin Associates, um, we do something called a blueprint strategy. First of all, consulting is always free at Laughlin. And then we can do a blueprint strategy, which we do charge for, which says, 
oh, you have all these disparate assets or I've got revenue coming in from three or four different places. You know, I, I signed up for an MLM and I've got like 500 bucks coming in and I'm working a W2 job and I sell on eBay and I also own four rental houses. Right. How many of uh, that's that's exactly probably the vast majority of our viewers, of the listeners, right yeah. there. <laughs> so then we can do a blueprint strategy and look at all the pieces and say, what do you actually need? Do you have more than you need? Do you not have what you need? Um, you know, Laughlin's we're come we're in our 49th year now. We're coming up on our 49th birthday. Our clients tend to stay with us for a very long time. We have 87% renewal rate, which is much higher than the typical rate of businesses that survive. Of other, yes. You know, our clients stay in business a lot longer and they stay with us for a long time because we help them through all the stages. And the way we do that is we don't oversell them, nor right. do we undersell them. We don't say, oh, really, that $99 filing fee is all you need. Yeah. Because that's a lie. And it's not, yeah, not true. It's a lie. And there are a lot of companies out there that will take your money for doing nothing, doing something you could have done for yourself. What is it? No low press or whatever. No, not, no, 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 no. We're not going to name names. I'm oh, not going to name names. Sorry, my bad. Uh, my bad. Uh, I named any, the name, not you. That is my so many, so many places. Um, just, they're just selling, right? It's a website driven business. They're just, they're just collecting dollars. They're not consulting. They're not helping. They're not guiding. They're not educating. Consequently, people will do the cheapest thing they can do. And it's never a problem until <laughs> they get into some sort of issue, <laughs> until a good it, issue or a problem. bad issue. Yeah. Right. But yes. so we would love to talk to people if they want to talk to us. Well, actually, how to, yeah, how how to stand. I, I've done it and I'm telling you, it is, uh, it, it was an eye opener about not just ownership of the company, but I am now prepared. I, your, your guys come to me all the time and uh, I think it's quarterly. We have a quarterly meeting that your, that your team hosts for me. So I don't even have to think about it. And they come in and say, all right, let's take our minutes and do our thing and fill out. And what things do we need to become aware of or whatever? I'm like, hold it. This is awesome. So there are, I, the, and it's so, I mean, this is not, I, I, I don't know where we're going. We didn't, we didn't just so everybody knows Marilyn, and I did not come up with a game plan. This is us free forming right now. Yeah, completely. Uh, but that program that you're describing, which we call our corporate veil protection service, which was, didn't exist when we bought the company. Um, but we listened to our employees and one of our employees came and said, you know, we get this, these ad hoc sort of questions about um, what am I supposed to be doing with minutes, resolutions? Uh, how often should I be holding board meetings and so on? And there were enough people interested in that topic that we went to the two largest law firms in Nevada, got, um, uh, got uh, legal opinions about what could we do that would solve that problem without practicing law without a license, because we don't want to do that. <laughs> right. And um, we put this program into place about 15 years ago. And I'm now, I mean, I've been for years, I'm convinced it's the most important thing that we do because without that compliance part, without that, then everything else falls apart. If you don't have that part, right. Everything else that you've built, I don't care how successful you are. I don't care if that corporate record book isn't done properly. They just will disregard the entity and say, no, you're a sole proprietor. And I'm going to, I'm, I now I'm in charge of your ass. I'm suing you for your assets because this, it's not even been pierced. It's been totally obliterated. Well, yeah, the but, reason why I brought this up, because we were cut, cut, like you said, we're, we're riffing on this, but the reason why I brought up my experience with you is because I find that we're in the exact same place right now, kind of 
globally, right? We all built our businesses, guys, entrepreneurs. We all built our businesses based on um, that the sun is shining and, you know, and, and all of the indicators are going up. It could be a little bit, could be a lot of bit. We all kept prices rising for our real estate clients and notes and everybody is planning and the, the planning for good. And the greatest, one of the greatest, uh, uh, I, I have two huge uh, observations. The single most powerful experience, uh, human experience is denial. The, and that's what we're going to be facing here really soon. Oh, yeah, it's not happening. It's only going to last a week or a month. It doesn't have to last forever, but we go to denial. Next thing is, is that we tend to believe that what's happening today is going to always happen for the rest of our life. Good is going to keep going like this or bad is going to keep going like this. And we're always going to be there. We never, the, the, that's why we started out our conversation today is we're about the roller coaster. How do we prosper on the upswing and how do we ride and prosper on the downswing, yeah, right? You don't, you don't, if you are prepared and a lot of people are not, and I understand that. This is a hard time for a lot of people, but for those that are prepared and going through your training and getting your debts under control, doing this sort of, um, the, 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 the system that you teach that, um, where you're using the bank's weapons against them, <laughs> right? right? We're weaponizing. To wipe out strategies. interest, to, to pay things down quickly, to get your credit score up, to get access to credit lines and so on. So you have access to capital. Right. Yeah, you might have to pay it back, of course, but can you make a greater return with that money than you're paying in interest? Absolutely. The arbitrage, right? the leverage is everything that, that we teach. Yes. So if you're, if you're organized, if you've been listening to Merrill Chandler, if you've become fundable, if you, if you do that part right, and you have your structural stuff, the stuff we do right, where you're safe, where you've got a, a impenetrable wall, Kevlar bodysuit, piranhas in the moat. I mean, <laughs> really, seriously, right. you're ready. Then these things that seem terrifying uh, to other people are actually like going to a freaking fire sale for you. And yes. I'll tell you, the, uh, it, it's been about, Maybe it was just, I don't know. The time is freaking <laughs> weird right now. I've lost track of time. Um, but here's the thing. In the very recent past, the stock market really tanked and dropped from 26,000 to 18,000. Yes. Right? A huge drop. Over, yeah, enormous. that's over the last month to six weeks. Yeah. No, no. This is over the last two weeks. Oh, this is, this is real more. recent. <laughs> um, and everybody... I, I would come on to meetings with people and they're like, oh my gosh, I can't, I don't even want to look at my 401k. My shares are down. It's a, I've lost so much value. Well, you only lost value if you sold, right? If you sold, you're only, you're going to realize that. And I had to remind people and I'll remind people right now. Yes. The stock market did go from 26 to 18. Yes. Yes. A lot of people lost their shorts in that, but you have to remember when those shares plummeted like that and you saw the share go from a hundred dollars to uh, you know, let's call it $50, right. And you lost half your value. Somebody bought that share at $50 <laughs> while you're trying to unload them. Somebody <laughs> bought while you were dumping out of fear because they were prepared because yeah. they had access to capital because they had a feeling that this is just terror run amok. And I'm going to buy right now at this low point. And you know what? We're back up at 22 again now. Whether it's five, two, two, two months, two years, or two decades, we, it, it's, it, it is this cycle, right? So hey, we had a couple of questions that were popped up. I had a couple of hands. Um, sure. I, I wanted to l let them point this out. Kirk, I'm going to, I just made you, uh, if you're, if you're listening, I just made, let you talk. Unmute. I, I guess. There he goes. Hello. Oh, there you are. 
<laughs> Sorry, I'm right in the middle of dinner. What was the question? <laughs> oh, I was just wondering. Uh, you had raised your hand. I didn't think it were saying hi. Did you have a question for uh, uh, for Aaron or myself or what we're discussing here? Or you? Oh no. Sorry, I'm in listen only mode. It must got hit in my pocket. Sorry. <laughs> no worries. All right. Glad Enjoy to dinner, have Kirk. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. Have a great night. All right. And Brandon, did you have uh, you raised your hand? Did you have a question or did you uh, hit the 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 un, the mute button? Hey, what's up, you guys? Can you hear me? Yes, yes sir. we can. Fire away. Uh, thank you both for putting this. Uh, in the very informative. Uh, I just had a question, I guess, about the issuing yourself a stock in an LLC. Uh, I'm, I'm I'm a chef, man. I just you know it's been tough <laughs> right now trying to get this going on. I'm trying to see and look at the opportunities and see the pivot. I, I just don't understand how do you issue yourself a stock? You're on stock in a brand new company. Hold on, I I I can only get part of that. Say it one more time. Merrill, can you restate the question? He was saying I'm 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 a chef. I'm looking for the pivot and then, and then it faded there. You're looking for what to do now. Well, I want, yeah. Ask your question one more time, Brandon. Can you guys hear me? I know there's, yes. okay. There was a noise from somewhere. Um, how do you issue yourself stock in a brand new LLC? I guess. Yeah. That's the question. Okay. okay good. Excellent question. Okay. So depending on how you got the LLC, if you just went to the secretary of state, um, all you will have gotten back is a, the, the, um, something similar to in a corporation, what would be your articles of incorporation. This will be your a receipt. The, <laughs> yes, basically a receipt. Um, if you have a corporate minute book, do, let's ask that question. Do you have a corporate minute book and a seal stock certificate? Do you have all that or did you do something online um, quickly the, which is what most people do that don't know. That's they, where they start. Yeah. No, man, I do not. Um, luckily, my wife is a, a paralegal, so she kind of has an idea about these things that I do not. This is this would be to start something today, tomorrow, or the next couple weeks. I okay. Think, so. Okay. So, Brandon, um, if you don't have the LLC yet and you want to talk about what to do... Because I'm, if you, hold on, Brandon, do you have an LLC now or are you thinking that you may set one up? I'm thinking I'm, I may set one up. Okay. okay. There you go. So I'm going to say something. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a CPA. I'm not giving legal or accounting advice. I'm a business guy who buys and sells companies, has had many hundreds of employees. <laughs> and uh, be saying, have, I'm a genius. <laughs> and I have currently tens and tens of thousands of clients. Okay, so I have some experience. Um, for me, if, if I'm going to be the owner of a company or if it's going to be me and my spouse, not my girlfriend or boyfriend, not my kid, not my parent, just me and my spouse. This is very important. Not your common law spouse, your actual married legal Another piece of paper, husband or <laughs> wife. Okay. In, in an LLC spouses are considered one member. Okay. Remember that together one member limited liability companies can certainly be owned by just one member. Absolutely. But in that situation, see LLCs, limited liability company, the, by definition, the LLC was to limit liability between partners. So if Merrill and I were starting a business together and we were not going to go public or be acquired by a public company, we were just gonna start something together. We would almost 100% form an LLC to do that because LLCs give us both a ton of protection, have tremendous flexibility, are super easy to set up, easy to transfer assets in and out of. LLCs are great for two or more people as long as the two people are not married. All right. 
If you're a one owner company or you're a spouse owned company, you and your spouse, my way of doing it is to form an S corporation instead of using an LLC. Well, why Aaron? Well, I'll tell you why. Because if you're um, a significant member, uh, let's use the word shareholder. It's not precisely it's right, LLC, but the idea is right. the percentage of the company. If you're a significant shareholder, which I think is anything over 20%, that's what, cannot that's what be makes, a, yeah. you cannot be a W-2 employee of an LLC. You have to just be a member and you, the only way you take money is as a distribution. And a distribution is the most expensive way you can take the money out of the company. Right. All right. Whereas now if Marilyn and I started an LLC, we can't be, we can't be W2 employees either. Um, but we have a lot of asset protection value. Okay. But from a, from a operating day-to-day month to month perspective, more people worry about taxes than lawsuits. A one member LLC is considered a disregarded entity as it relates to asset protection. In other words, they ignore it. The only person who can be responsible is the one member. Likewise, uh, as I said, they can't take, they can only take distributions. An S corporation, Brandon, an S corporation, you can be the shareholder, but you can also be an employee of that company. And you can get on to pay stubs on a W-2 status with your own company that you're the shareholder of. Because remember, the company is separate from you. It isn't you. It's a separate paper person. And it, you may be the shareholder, but you're not the company. Correct. All right. And you can get on to pay stubs and you can be an employee now, not self-employed, but you're employed by this corporation Here's my pay stub so you can go to the bank and get a car loan or whatever. And you can have the company paying for half of your social security or, you know, your FICA FUTA distribution. Half of that gets to be a write-off. Whereas in an LLC, you have to eat all of it yourself. And the company can do all these other things, pay for your cell phone bill, give you a car allowance, do all these other things that would just be a distribution from an LLC. So a a one owner company or a company owned by spouses. And in today's day and age, you guys, the reason I'm not saying husband and wife is because a lot of spouses are not a man and a woman. A lot of spouses are two men, two women, or however you want to identify. The fact is if you're a spouse, spouses, it's all considered part of your, your home estate. And it's one member. That one member. If you haven't done it yet, and you're going to be the primary owner, it's go, or it's going to be you and your spouse, I would love you to seriously consider an S corporation to pivot with because it'll give you a lot more traction than an LLC will for the exact same price, exact same obligation. Now, how do you issue shares? If you work with a company like us, or if you go to like a law firm, you'll spend t- 10 times more money with a law firm. But you'll get the same result, which is you'll get the right kind of entity set up in the right place. You'll have an EIN number. You'll have a corporate record book. You'll have stock certificates or membership. Memberships. If it's an LLC, you'll have an, it will, we will walk you through the initial meeting, the startup meeting, and then we will help you with your minutes and resolutions ongoing. And is there a fee for that? Yes. Is it super freaking affordable? Yes. Um, lawyers and accountants cannot believe that we can do what we do for tens of thousands of companies for the prices that we charge. But that's why we have tens of thousands of clients, including a bunch of lawyers and accountants. Um, so the way you do it is you have a corporate minute book, there are shares in it. You have to have the courage to take a membership certificate or a stock certificate out and fill it out. And then most of us look at those things out of the company. Yeah. But most of us look at the certificates and are scared to write on them because we don't exactly know what that means, but it doesn't mean anything. It's like saying, no, you own this many shares. 
there are a hundred shares authorized to be issued and you own a hundred shares or yep. there's a hundred shares authorized and you are issuing yourself 10 shares and the other ones are sitting there if you ever decide you want to issue them but right now you're the only shareholder period the end and it's super easy to do but there's so many things that small business owners don't know and hundreds of things that need to be written down as a board resolution correct including i'm going to sign a contract you know i'm going to change cpas i want to put petty cash in the drawer I want a car allowance. I want a health membership. I want to, uh, get all that has to be in the minutes. And it goes, I, I want to open a bank account. I want to get, take a loan. There's a million things. And if you don't know what they are, and if you don't put them in the right format and put them timely into your record book, if you're ever examined, you're screwed basically, because it's too late to unwind it. Then you've got to ride through the storm. And then we have a lot of people come to us what I call event driven, they've been through a horrible event and they never want that to happen again. And so they come to us. Go ahead, Mary. I've, I've been talking a lot. I just looked at, we've been on for over an hour. No, this is, so I wanted to, I wanted to wrap up with a final question. Um, I, uh, Brad, my partner has uh, shared this uh, Chinese proverb a number of times and it applies to what you just finished with there. It said, uh, he says, um, so when is the best time to, to plant an oak tree well i know this 20 one. years ago right yep. when is the second best time to plant an oak tree today and you're saying people are coming to you event driven we've had a whole slew of our clients just like you're talking about who've come back said you know what i need to get my fundability in play because there's going to be an amazing opportunity when when all, when the homes start to crashing in value and i'm not ready and i'm like so this is a good i mean my business is good your business it, we it's we're good. driven by we're yeah. driven by events or many of our clients and and students are driven by events so you guys um we're gonna one last question to ask you aaron about this if you had if you had one and business personal whatever if you had one recommendation to tell somebody to make them feel more prepared or more safe or at least more in their mind and body right now what would you what would you tell them it's interesting okay i didn't know you're gonna ask me that question but i i know exactly what i would tell them there's a lot of fear right now if you're a business owner if you're if you've been displaced from a job there's a tremendous amount of of uncertainty right now right. and and that La lack of ease, that dis-ease can literally make you sick, can make you want to drink, can make you want to get abusive, can make you, we always fill a vacuum, a lack of knowledge, a lack of, of certainty with worst case scenario, right? <laughs> it's all or and, nothing, right? <laughs> so here's my counsel. And this, this is going a little bit off in a different direction, nope. not where we were going a minute let me just tell you what, what I've learned to do over the years. When everything goes to hell and I'm like, oh my gosh, and I start to feel that anxiety and I'm waking up at two in the morning in sweats and I'm freaking out a little bit. Um, I learned this a long time ago and I, I, I give this to all of you. When you get into that mode, when you're in fear mode, allow yourself to go there because you know what? The fear is real. You're feeling a legitimate thing. You're not weak or wrong to feel that. Yes. So let your mind go there and say to yourself, even speak it out loud, if it will help your inner child allow you to go there. All right. What is the worst case scenario? What's the worst thing in this circumstance? What's the worst thing that could happen? With one exception, with the exception of death, because if you die, who cares? It's done. Yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> Others will be sad, problem. but you'll be done. Yeah. So, but if your business is in trouble, your job's in trouble, your rent is in trouble, your mortgage, you fear that you won't be able to make the mortgage three months from now, go to that worst case scenario and look at it and write it down and get clear 
this is the worst thing that could happen. And then ask yourself, okay, if that happens, what will I do? If I'm on the street naked with, and everyone's left me and I've lost all my assets, <laughs> well, then what? Right. And as soon as you get the then what, as soon as you go, well, I would go to a shelter and get some clothes. If my business fails, I'll go to the SBA and, and get this one of these loans. I'll get a job. I'll start something new. I'll uh, reduce my expenses. Whatever, whatever it is, figure out worst case scenario and then ask yourself, okay, in that situation, then what would I do? And do the next right thing. Make yes. the next right step. As soon as you can identify the worst case scenario and what you would do if you ever got there, it takes the teeth out of the monster. Because That's now, awesome. you know, no matter what, you have another game plan. And that will take a lot of it out. And guys, I went, I told you that bankruptcy story. I went from on my butt, flat, flat, broke. If I told you some of the crazy things I had to do to just survive, you would just, you'd be amazed. Um, crazy stuff. And out of that worst case scenario, came this great job that made me rich. And then I then expanded that, okay? I went to prison. I went to prison. That was the worst thing I could imagine ever because I thought no one will ever trust me. The first person when I got out of prison to invite me to go speak on his stage was Brian Tracy, one of the gurus. And that exploded a speaking career, right? Every time you think you're in the ditch, just look around and go, okay, I've hit the bottom. Now everything's up from here. Everything is a possibility from yeah. this moment. So don't worry about it. The best, the best things always happen in times of fear, of chaos, of lack. We, we, we have all of our growth in the difficult times. And I know that sounds corny, but it's just true. Unless it's absolutely true. It's true. Guys, you're going to do fine. Can I, is it okay, Meryl, to Absolutely. tell them something we're doing that's free? Yep. That's my, maybe would help. And I, I, first of all, I want to tell you, I'm so glad that I'm following your counsel because my credit <laughs> score keeps going up. I keep getting calls to get new. Hey, can we double your credit line? Absolutely. Freaking amazing. So Meryl Chandler, even in these times guru. that happens. It's so yeah. the thing I want to say is we have a, a Facebook group we call Laughlin, L-A-U-G-H-L-I-N, Laughlin Thrive. And we set it up during all this pandemic stuff and we're just feeding stuff in there. We've got, it's a pretty darn active group. Awesome. Um, uh, there's a lot of cool stuff going on there. Um, and so anyway, long and short of it is, um, that would be a place where you can go. There's no selling, no pitching, no nothing. It's just awesome. a place that we're trying to provide a ton of education and a ton of sort of vetted information that's going in there and a way for you to pop up and say, here's what I do for a living or here's what I'm trying to do and see if there's anybody else in the group that can work with you or give you ideas. How does that support? Yeah. So awesome. please, if you want. That's you Laughlin's Thrive. Laughlin, and for our podcast audience, that'll be in the notes. Uh, Laughlin Thrive. Yeah, thank you for having me on, Meryl. I know I'm a long-winded guest. No, I, the thing is, is your long-windedness because you have a you have a fullness of experience, and that's what that's what was important to me is because I come from a financial. You know, how do we how do we set our uh, all, all the chess pieces up, and then how do we play chess regardless of the weather outside? Right? I mean, we're moving, and you're, you're absolutely right. People, our clients are getting credit limit increases right now because they've hit all the right markers and are telling all the right things to the lenders they're like oh lenders want to make money in in a recession sure so you come from a perspective of how do then we protect because guess what in our the entities we encourage our clients we want a million dollars in credit line sitting that entity i don't want somebody coming in and swooping anything and closing them down or whatever it is right those are assets within that entity so yeah. your your counsel is 
is extremely valuable, uh, both personally as well uh, because of our uh, many of the roller coasters we've been through in our <laughs> lives, right? So, yeah, amen. Thank you for being here tonight. Uh, this is Merrill Chandler, your host of the Get Fundable podcast, getfundablebook.com, getfundablebootcamp.com. Make sure you guys uh, uh, go to his Thrive, uh, Laughlin Thrive Facebook page if you would like to stay in touch with mad, mad, mad intelligence and, and, and strategies. Guys, it has been a pleasure. Glad our, our, our uh, Zoom audience has been with us. Glad our Facebook audience is here. You guys have a spectacular evening. Be kind, be safe, and take care of each other because the person you treat shitty today may be the person you're knocking on their door for that, that has an amazing opportunity when all this clears up. Invest in your friends, family, and associates, and let everybody know that you have their back, guys. Let everybody know you have their back. You have a spectacular night. Thank you again, Aaron, for being here. This has been a, a treat. Thank you so much. Good night, everybody. Thank you for listening to the Get Fundable podcast. Please leave comments because Meryl would love to read about your aha moments from this episode. And be sure to visit GetFundable.com to read our blog, get important links, join our community, and much, much more, like ordering Merrill's tell-all book that is changing the world, The New F Word. And you got to tell your friends about this podcast, because we want them to get fundable too. <laughs>